Thanks for stopping by Big Top Gaming. My name is Brian. And I'm Ethan. And today we're doing something a little bit different in our War Machine Battle Report. We're kind of playing a normal game. Typically what we do is we show up with like one list that we really want to play. And sometimes those lists don't really interact well with one another. Like the Xerxes vs. Sturmandrang one was probably the best example where I just really wanted to play Xerxes too. And Ethan was like, I'll bring a bunch of huge bases too. And then that was not good. It was good for you. It was good for me, but being being good for me game-wise and good experience-wise was not the same. So this time we've decided to play like we normally would in like the wild, right? Um, I have my two list pairing and Ethan has his two list pairing, so we're just throwing down with those to see what happens. I decided to play Kator this time around, and my pairing was Zerkova 1 in Flames in the Darkness paired up with uh, Old Witch 2 in Wolves of Winter. And I think some people might get a little bit like confused on the style of lists that I'm dropping here. And this is just kind of building off of an old theory that I had where when you build two lists that have the same type of composition, in this case, a bunch of infantry, your opponent kind of gets forced into taking one of their lists that's really good at dealing with that uh, that style of play. So by dropping two lists in front of Ethan that have a ton of units of infantry, it means that he has to pick the list that is better suited to taking out that infantry. So that makes it so that I can then figure out which list is going to be better for me to drop based on what tools he has in which list that's going to be able to deal with those. So for this time around, I've decided to drop uh, Zerkova 1 in Flames in the Darkness. And we'll move over to Ethan now to talk about your pairing, and then we'll talk about why I decided what I did. Sure. So my pairing this week is Jaga Jaga and Will Work for Food paired with Lord... I'm going to... Az- Azazel. Azazel. <laughs> I'm just going to say Lord Az. Sure. Uh, Lord Az. Az. Azzy. Azzy, yep. Azzy and Will Work for Food as well with a list that I have titled in my war room as 13 fucking solos. Yep. Because he's... Like, I, I wanted to build like a Sorsha... A, a classic 13 yeah a classic mark II sources 13 list where it's just like you take all the high powered solos you can like all the riot quest solos the new ones like gudrun 2 the new tharn guy uh the wastelander like all those guys just eat that feet up mm-hmm. and repost is just so good uh the new tharn guy getting caps out in my list at pow 27 so it's just like trivially one round of colossal because yeah. why not even though you're bringing a ton of solos you still have the potential to do a lot of damage and then the will work for food with jaga is uh, a kind of a twist on a jaga list i used to run before i think i took a version of this to uh wisconsin team championship like a couple years ago where it was jaga with four swamp whores yep uh, this one was jaga with three swamp whores and then i got melvin and mayhem in there and then like double effort scouts scythe uh, Wastelander, Void Archon, and that's the list I ended up dropping into your pairing because it just brings enough infantry clearing, and it with Overtake, Killing Spree, Reach, it just seemed like the safe bet. Yep, so the reason why I ended up dropping Zerkova 1 is that Ethan has a pretty condensed battle group. It doesn't seem to spread out really well, so... Zerkova's feet should be able to catch most of, if not all, of his army. There will be some pieces I'd probably miss based on like the shooting models that can come scalpel things out, but I felt like Zerkova had a better chance of controlling the game here. Uh, Old Witch 2 definitely has a, a way of like doing damage more across the board because she doesn't need to support the things like with the, the the flames in the darkness list you need to apply the buffs in order to get the damage to spike and zirkova has plenty of those in her list to be able to do that we've got ragman hermit gabriel throne and alexia three so i don't have any problems with that but the old witch list i just felt like um i wanted more control in this game so zirkova one's the one that got dropped So I won the role to go first, and I elected to go first, which is pretty much seems like the stock standard <laughs> thing I do every game. And like I even like when I won the role, I was like, maybe I should think about going second, just because I never do. And then I was like, I really don't want Zerkova running top of one and then feeding on my army top of two. 
So like I needed to get up the board. I feel like that's always my excuse. I think you're I think you're just really threatened by what Zerkova can do and it's not that you shouldn't be because it is pretty pretty nasty. So um I don't I understand your position. So Jaga went up put battle host on herself, ghost walked the horror that got into the woods a little bit and then put grave winds on the wastelander who is proxied once again by Maximus because yep, we I have just, yet to find one. Just still haven't picked him up. I'm sure there's one in Bearboo, but I just haven't done it. And I'm just keeping most of the stuff up there outside 19 of the Thamrakes. I don't want to just trivially lose something. I mean, with Gravewind, Blade Shield, and Concealment, uh, the Wastelander's sitting at a cool def 21. I'm pretty de-incentivized from shooting you. Yeah. Uh, I love Gravewind on him because it's just like he's so, like, good. It just means he gets to go where go where he wants to, goes where he wants to because most people aren't going to be trying to shoot that unless they know for sure they can hit it mm -hmm. and the thamorite cannot so i tried deploying so i can get uh, a swamp whore on each of the circle zones one in the middle wrestler in the middle and then melvin and mayhem is up on the bottom and then my effort scouts stayed way back So I need to be thinking about how to lessen the impact of Ethan's heavies. Um, with Overtaken, will work for food and the 4-inch reach on the Swamp Horrors. Uh, things can get pretty deep, and my guys are not really difficult to hit under Sign's importance with Mat 6. Like, there's a chance they could miss, especially if there's a Archon hanging around buffing them. But for the most part, I need to try and uh, mitigate a lot of this damage coming in. So I decide to measure threat ranges and just say, okay, this is the world I'm going to live in. I'm going to have to get not very far into the scenario, but I'm, I'm able to get into it later, right? So right now I'm just kind of running the precursors up. They've kind of checked the bubble of where they can and cannot go. And they're sitting right outside the edge of Malvin and Mayhem's maximum threat. They're sitting at the edge of the maximum threat of the Swamp Horror and Rassler. And even though I'm only just basically getting up to like a little bit over my AD line, I'm pretty okay with this. Uh, I need to make sure that Ethan unpacks into me. And I think I might be able to utilize that, uh, that acid pool in the middle to try and make Ethan think that I won't go over it. Because if I need to, I will. If I if if I have to trade four precursors for a swamp horror, like I'll easily do that. So on the top zone, there's less up there I have to contend with. There's the uh, the void archon, which I want to kind of I don't want to just unpack a bunch of stuff into that either. So what I do is I dangle a couple legion of lost souls out there and just say, okay, Ethan, if you want to do this, then. I'll at least get my vengeance and then try and collapse that upper zone because I am much better off scoring it than Ethan is given that the only thing he's got over there are two swamp gobbers that can deal with the zone. Next up, I position uh, a Thamorite Advocate in the trench just in case there's some healing that she needs to shut off. And we walk up the Thamorite to kind of exist behind these guys so that it can still be quite threatening. And the Marwin goes there too just to make sure she can put her buffs where she needs to. Um, given that Ethan's got signs importance, it's not the greatest piece in the universe because he should be hitting pretty well, but at least she's still a threatening piece that he's going to have to worry about given that she's got blind on her, or crit blind on her shield and sword. I can just layer a bunch of buffs. Next up, I decide to throw some clouds out and not to block line of sight so much. I'm trying to use these to make sure that if the Void Archon wants to come up and shoot Legion of Lost Souls, uh, he's less likely to hit. Now, I know that that kind of seems counterproductive with the idea of putting uh, the Legion of Lost Souls out to bait a spray, but this way I think it kind of puts Ethan in a spot where he doesn't know if I want them to die or if I don't want them to live. Like, either way, it's good for me. If you come up and take a shot and you miss, then that's fine. It means that I can charge that Legion of Lost Souls in next turn. If you come up and kill one, I'll get vengeance, and then I'll just destroy that whole side of the table.
So my plan this turn is to just try and contest the zones without proccing vengeance. Because like he said, he put up some Legion of Lost Souls. I'm not taking that bait because that will literally collapse aside. And since I was able to get up the board far enough, he had to stay back. So my plan is to get far enough in the zones where even if I can't charge next turn, with elasticity and speed buffs, I can threaten the whole zone. And then there I'm measuring effort scouts, 21 inch threat. And I held them back way far because I was worried about uh, Sir Kova doing her plus five range ability on her spells, which works on arc nodes. So she has a 15 inch hex blast range. So with the arc node running 12, like that's a 27 inch threat. So I just had to respect that. Yep, and it, it, I wasn't like I was just forgetting that this was going to go on. Well, I knew that the Everett Scouts could do some work to the Lancer, but I just kind of forgot they existed because they were so far back. So this was definitely a misplay on my part, putting the Lancer where I did. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to try and capitalize on Marksman to take out his Arc Node. And there I'm just moving up my heavies in the middle because I know he's going to feat the next turn. Like It's pretty much a given, so I'm making Fort Jaga. I put up Signs Importance, Camp 2, Call Life Good. And then just measure my control so I can keep the Swamp Horror that's over there in control. And there I'm measuring his threats. And then there's an 8-inch stick because I, I actually did the math without Battle Host. Because if uh, he feats, I can't run or charge, but I can walk 4, 6 with Battle Host, 4-inch melee. So actually I threaten 10 inches around the zone. Yeah, but I went up enough where I could threaten eight, because like, it's been a hot minute since I played Jaga, so like factoring in battle host threats on the Swamp Horrors walking, is whenever I think about them not being able to charge, I'm used to playing against Grim, yep. where they just walk where they lose one speed inch. Too, yeah, so like, that's always rough. Mm -hmm. So now I'm just setting up on the t the bottom side where that horror is running. It's gonna be just outside threat. And then there's Melvin and Mayhem ready to come in. So if he wants to contest that zone with precursors, even under his feet, I am more than willing to hit the button. Signs importance. Put elasticity, because you know what's better than one inch melee killing spree? Two inch melee killing spree with signs importance, because that's it's but nanas. Yeah, Melvin and Mayhem is just disgusting. Yes. Like when you can friendly faction buff some I know I talked about it last time I played him, but like I felt like this would show off more stuff he can do yeah uh, there i end up going i choose column three to try and take out his arc node with the poor effort scouts and then a dice minus two because of a shield uh dice minus three he does decent damage does the first five i need yeah you got me the three. first column and then i think i'm only just a couple boxes away from losing my arc node completely yep because his arc node is down three boxes on the <laughs> I call them three because I'm tight. And then three boxes down on column four. So realistically, I just need to do six. And then there I'm just measuring that effort scout walking up. But I'm trying to hug back or hug down as far as I can to not get line of sight over the obstruction, which I end up not being able to, but I crank it and hit. And then there I just really crank the damage and take out his arc node. Yeah, so the now my Lancer's kind of committed to just being like an annoyance piece instead of a do-work piece. And that he's really like, one of the things that makes this Zirkova list so good is the Lancer. So me losing it this early is really unfortunate. And I just should have been paying more attention to where the effort scouts were. I just completely spaced them. Mm -hmm. And then Scythe was just out of range. Otherwise I would have tried to go in there with some multi-fire shots and maybe try and take him out. Uh, Void ends up flying just into the rubble because I'm there's only a couple Legion of Lost Souls I can get on him and I feel like if he's going for the Void he's not going for the Swamp Horror and sitting in the rubble he's def 18 so I'm feeling pretty good about that against Thamorites and then pretty much just pass turn and hope for the best.
All right, so now I've just got to really figure out, you know, how I'm going to apply my feet this turn, and I've got some things that I can take. I really would have liked to have been able to get the chance to grab Malvin and Mayhem, because as soon as that jack is gone, my life gets a lot easier, because it's an independent source of damage dealing and, and absolute mayhem, right? That <laughs> I know it's that's a good one. Uh, that he can just really collapse all of my precursors. Like, it, it's really... It doesn't take a lot of work for him to go through those. Nope. Signs important sixes and the auto kills. Like, yep. the only thing that can stop him are tough checks. Yep. And I don't have, I guess I have like the um, battle plan for it, but Stir the Blood is going to be probably one of the one, one of the ones that I use the most. So I think over here was where we, I moved up the, or I aimed with the Thamorite because I was in aiming range and took some shots at the Void Archon to try and pepper that down before. And you wrecked his I shit. I sure did. I left him on one box, which it's unfortunate that it's only one box. You always feel like, oh, maybe I could have just gotten a little bit more mileage out of it, but I'm pretty happy with that. It means that uh, the, there's a good chance that the Legion of Lost Souls isn't going to have to go in there and try and kill him. I do want that, that Void Archon gone, but with Zerkova having such a massive threat on things, uh, on Hex Blast specifically, uh, I feel like she can get she probably can get the job done. I end up putting Gallant up, and I'm trying to kind of finagle him to get him out of threat range of, um, or not out of threat range, but at least get him out of uh, being able to be hit over the wall or not over the wall by that wrestler. So he's just towing the zone and as far over as he can get so that I can try and get some extra defensive bonuses out of that because I'm defense 15 over the wall then, and I don't think the wrestler appreciates that even with signs important. No, that's nine's the hit. Yep, so... Next up, I think uh, Gabriel Throne is going, and he's just putting out tough on something and maybe shooting something. Oh, he tried to take a pot shot at the Archon. That's what it was. And he stirred the blood on the Legion. Yep, stirred, stirred blood on Legion um, because I do feel like I have a really good... Ho I re really have a good plan for taking out that Archon. I was kind of hoping that Gabriel could just grab it. So instead, uh, I have to unpack Zerkova. She's towing the zone, which is really dangerous for her, given where all those beasts are. But I think if I just kind of apply myself right, I'm not going to be so much threatened by a bunch of overtaking uh, heavies. And then I decide to make sure I've got my line to the Void Archon, and I choose the plus five range for spells and boost a Hex Blast in. I end up connecting, and then I boost damage, and that just takes him out. So now Zakrova, I think, is sitting on one after upkeeping Watcher. Yeah, because Hex Blast is three and then boost, boost. So she's sitting on one. She's okay, though. I think the way we unpack everything will make it so that she's feeling pretty comfortable. So now I get to do all sorts of fun stuff. The Thamorite Advocate goes up, and she's just getting close enough to throw a POW-13 Hex Blast in there. Or Hex Bolt, one or the other. The not one Zerkova has. And she cranks damage at dice minus two or dice damage, I can't remember. Dice minus two. Dice minus two, she does four damage to the two, which is pretty good for him since he doesn't have a lot of boxes and that attack wasn't expected to do a ton. So it, the next thing we have is Alexia goes first to apply her power of death buff, and that makes sure that the Legion of Lost Souls can get maximum damage out there too, because now they've been stirred for plus two damage. Power of death is going to give them another plus two damage, and with charging in three of them, it's dicey, but it's pretty decent odds that they can take down that Swamp Horror with these charges. Now, I probably, like, the rest of these guys are just running. I don't really have the range to get them anywhere. So their goal is to just kind of get in this zone, make sure the whole unit's there, uh, because with this being the bottom of two, there is a good chance that I can score this one. So uh, I think the way I've positioned every... Yeah, I had to fish that guy back into the zone. So now I'm just checking out their stats again because I want to make sure I get this right. And they're base POW 12, so they're going to be crashing in with POW 16s. The first one rolls double ones to miss, but the second one ends up doing a, a dice plus one, I think. So it was a, a decent amount of damage for the, first, for the second one that hit. Or for the first one that hit, sorry. And then the second one that hit didn't do a ton back to it. I think we just have the body out, and it's sitting on like maybe 10 boxes. I believe 12 and you took out the body almost to the box. Yeah, so one more one more that that first attack that would have hit would have been nice. It might not have killed him, but at dice plus 1 it wasn't unlikely to do so. You maybe. need an 11. Yeah, I need on an 11. Two it was really the 4. If the 4 would have spiked a little bit more then maybe he'd be okay. So at least it's beat up. Um I'm still it's unfortunate that I wasn't able to take it out. Yeah, I forgot. Like I don't know how I forgot that. Oh, yeah, Flames hits really, really hard, so it almost took just three dudes to kill a Swamp Horror. 
Yep. Because that that like that's the the theme benefit. You just stack all the buffs. I think there are probably maybe some other things. Is like Ragman and the Hermit are over there, so maybe Ragman could have gotten up close enough. But with no repo on him right now, which he would probably get in another theme, I think Laylee's resistance. You can do yeah, that with Gibbs. With, with Gibbs. Um, I wouldn't be able to get there. So right now the the camera battery died, which is really unfortunate because the it's not that this turn does a lot of work or anything, but what you will notice is that um, there were a lot of different like positioning things. So it doesn't look like the precursors moved so much, but they did kind of curve out to kind of stay out of some threat ranges. Uh, now Ethan's heavies can't trample or charge them at all, and uh, the rest of it was just jamming with the... Uh, the char or not charger the lancer and just making sure that i've got a good contingency plan for next turn and then we'll roll into ethan's turn So going into my turn three, uh, no points were scored, luckily, or almost like I planned it. Yeah, I was really hoping, I hoped that I could get that t that Swamp Horror out of there, but it just didn't go the way I wanted. If I had proc'd Vengeance, he would have died. Yeah. So like, I do not regret it. I did not expect the Void Archon to go down. Like, your Thamorites, I've rolled three shots. I think only one of them has gone so far, but he rolled mm -hmm. three and then he hit two of the shots and just cranked it. I think in that turn, the bottom Thamorite, which we missed during the camera die, had had also gone forward and shot. I think we put a couple points of damage into the, the Rassler, Rassler. Yep. And you but rolled he three rolled three again. as well. So my Thamorites are hot right now. Yep. So trying to plan out what I'm going to do, and then I needed to get my one-inch steppers Yep. because Jaga is currently in Fort Jaga behind the Rassler, and the Swamp Horror next to the objective, but I'm trying to see if she can walk instead of run, because I realized I put the goobers on the wrong side. Like, I should have put them down south. I had figured Jaga would move that way eventually, but I didn't think I'd have this soon of an opportunity to score that zone, because all that's there is a Lancer, and, like, I feel like I need to get Jaga in there and start applying pressure. Yeah, because for and I moved these guys back because the goal was to get them out of the threat range of Malvin or the the swamp. The swamp when you moved the second row up, you hit the first row. Yeah, and then you just kind of stood them up. So like, I yeah, I just pushed them out of threat because you measured it, we knew it. Mm -hmm. And then Jaga's just trying to figure out because uh, the wastelander is in the way, and so is a swamp whore. And then Melvin goes. And then, like, as soon as I did, I was like, why didn't I sign importance first? And I'm just like, ah, screw it. Melvin, yeah, you don't need a lot to hit him. Yeah, Melvin just takes his initial, rolls a 7, pow 18, does 11. Yeah, it's rough. He's got two boxes left and movements out, so it's just a foregone conclusion, really. Yep. Took his fist and then killed him. And then he did the plus 2 armor ability this turn, just in case something gets on him. But my plan this turn is to try and kill as many precursors as I can, if not all of them, because I think Brian underestimated the Swamp Horrors walking and then overtaking their way through. Yeah, I wanted to kind of stay scenario relevant in the middle and make sure that my precursors, because otherwise we're just going to be standing off the whole game, and uh, I figured this way I get them up and maybe have a little bit of safety with them, but uh, we will see how this plans out, for, how this pans out for me. And then there, I realize now... I'm trying to see how far over I can get and get that other Swamp Horror back in control because he's currently in control. But if Jaga goes over there and Jaga wants to go first for signs importance because otherwise I don't want unboosted sevens to hit those guys because that's just a rough time. Uh, Wastelander just backs up to get out of the way. And then that gives me a better idea of where Jaga can go. And then the Swamp Horror that's in front ends up just walking to get right behind the Acid Pool. So now I've cleared a landing spot for Jaga. So I'm going to get in that zone and score it this turn. So I've guaranteed myself one point. So I feel like that's good to try and get the scenario lead, scenario lead on Flames instead of falling behind on them when they can just snowball pretty hard 
with all your strength buffs, but like we have this weird dance of if I get Melvin and Mayhem into a unit, it's going to be deleted. But if you get four dudes into me, it deletes my heavy. Yeah, we've got a real, real high potential for affecting our lists in a big way. And uh, I mine is a little bit more detrimental because my my threats are very consolidated and yours are a little bit more spread out. Yep. So the spell slave put ghost walk on Jaga so she could walk through the woods. She healed the body on the swamp horror, then walked and put signs of importance up. And now here's where I'm going to get super cute. I'm going to try and turn the horror around so it's not looking at the archon and then try to overtake my way back into control so that way I can buy attacks. Yeah, it's like the ballerina squid up here, which is, like I said, I, I, I wanted to kill that thing so bad. And I need sevens for this, and we math it out. I need three overtakes to get back in control. So, like, I need three of my four initials to hit. Yep, and that's it's dicey. I mean, I need sevens to hit. My bite hits, auto kills, I overtake. I'm basically turning backwards, so I'm not looking at the Archon. First tentacle hits, kills, overtake. Now I'm just out of control. Yep, this is some real Perseus stuff right here. I hit the 7, I roll the 8 to kill, and then boom, now I'm back in control so I can buy attacks, and I'm in Signs of Portance range, and now I'm turned facing directly towards the right, so I'm not looking at it. I believe I miss an attack. Yep. Now I buy, hit, overtake deeper into my control, and then I'm just living the squid dreams. Yeah, I think you probably had some fury left over to do some stuff, but I think we were a little worried about running hot this turn. Well, I knew that whore is going to die, so I really don't mind loading him up. Oh, gotcha. I, I thought that activation was done, but I guess it's still going. No, I was planning on which way to go, because like, I could maybe go for uh, more Legions of Lost Souls, but this time I walked down to take out a precursor. Yep, and then this is my big moment where I get to walk Gallant up because he ended within six inches of Zerkova, and I get to take a swing. And uh, we're at dice plus three. three, so we crank it and just destroy that guy. Yep. And so then, that was a good deal for me. Now I can save my guys a couple more swings. And then I forgot all about Watcher, but then luckily I remember Jaga's Field Marshal, Death Rage. So now this is where I get to get super cute. So I walk my three inches, and then I punch him, who just walked over the wall, with a tentacle. Yep, and you end up connecting really easily, and now damage isn't so great for him, like a couple boxes. I mean, I did four at dice minus six. Yeah, I guess like it's still not great damage. But now I've pulled him in to the Rassler's walk threat. Yep, I didn't see that one coming at all, so I, 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 I pulled the rug out from Ethan to grab that Swamp Horror before it destroyed things, and then he got me back for it by pulling the Rassler out. And there really wasn't any better place for me to go. Maybe I could have walked Gallant to where he was more behind the precursor to stop him from getting pulled anymore for, or getting pulled further but uh, I just didn't think about this when when it happened yeah usually people I think like everyone forgets about Jagas field marshal cuz yeah, minions cause it don't happen have, often yeah minions don't have they like they aren't known for field marshals I think Jagas the only one I can think of I mean Helga too has hell on wheels but that's not the same uh, so Rassler goes in rages himself you hermit the bite that hits which yep. is a super sad time yeah, I just wanted to make sure. I was hoping that maybe Gallant could survive if he was down one more thing. But having three initials, I, I probably could have saved the Hermit here and just like not had to deal with it. And Science Importance dice minus twos with the other initials are doing money. Yeah, they're doing a lot of work to him. So I do end up making you go full, so I feel a little bit redeemed in that. But uh, Gallant doesn't end up making it through that one, which is unfortunate. But I still feel like getting... The Swamp Horror was fine. Like, I, I just didn't want him to go causing a bunch more havoc in there. Maybe it was better to leave Gallant back and not Trigger Watcher. But I feel when one heavy goes for another heavy, I, I guess it's not not that they're equal or anything. It just wasn't a great deal. I mean, that Swamp Horror had 12 boxes left, and you rolled, like, exactly enough to kill it, which I was yeah. not expecting. And then... Or not enough. You rolled Boxcar, so you overkilled it. I overkilled it by quite a bit. So... Effort Scout moves up, plunks a, a precursor. No, we, you shoot it. You shoot at the at Thamorite Advocate, and then I shield guard away, forgetting that multi fire is a thing. Oh, like yep. I forgot the whole game that multi fire existed. Otherwise, my uh, battle priest would be back a little further. 
So now multi-fire is going to be going off. And uh, this is not a bad time to talk about uh, my list composition. I know that like the the battle priests look better in groups of three because that's a really efficient use of requisition. But for this list, I wanted more work from Zerkova's solos because she can defend against shooting pretty well with the, uh, with the clouds, which I haven't put up, so go figure. Um, but I didn't feel like I needed a ton of shield guards to make sure that they, uh, that things existed. Like I, I feel like the list is fine the way it is. Yep. I just happen to have a, a fish stick enlisted. My objective was Isla Sight just for the clouds. Yep. So it kind of shuts that down a bit for me. Yep. So now the other effort scout went up, plunked a dude, repoed back. So, uh, the gun package, like that's their job. They move up, they kill a bunch of dudes, they repo away. Uh, Scythe just uh, ran, ran and gun away. And now other Swamp Poor is going up, taking his initials, overtaken through. I'm going to pause this. And just basically cleaning up the middle zone. Because right now he's pretty much he's hit and killed every model he's touched, thanks to Sign's importance. Because normally, like, the Mat 6, POW 12 is kind of eh, but when you add an initial die, drop the lowest, suddenly things start to look pretty good. Yeah, and Defense 13 is good. It's just kind of over the bump of being, like, a really good stat that people miss sometimes but signs importance makes it so that these precursors are going down pretty regularly yep and i'm targeting the back ones now instead of that closest one because i'd be obstructed by the wall so i'm just trying to overtake farther up the board to try and get around that wall eventually and to kill that ua because i believe it's the ua that's tucked behind the wall and yep. i want to make sure that one hits yeah, you don't want him sticking around. Even if he's just one, it's still one weapon master attack. And with all the way I pump damage here, it could be pretty nasty. Yep. So take my last attack, hits, dice minus two, and I crank it with signs of importance. So he overtakes forward just to engage throne. So my beast did go pretty hot this turn, uh, but it's pretty good. So I'm missing quite a bit to start out this turn, and I wasn't, I think I wasn't expecting this, even though I probably should have been able to see it coming. Uh, losing all those solos, or losing all those precursors on the bottom to all the shooting was really unfortunate. Like, Scythe is just a really great package for not a lot for this type of infantry. Like, she just mows them down as long as you don't mess with the multi-fire rule. So that was a learning experience for me because I've never, every time I've played against Scythe, I've always taken her out because she was just like low-hanging fruit for me. So I never really got to experience what she did. I took the building back and maybe sent it off kilter because I wanted to make sure that I knew where the other gobber was in case I could try and get something weird back there to do something to it. Like maybe charging a Morrow and Archon real far and maybe having reach to it. But it doesn't look like where it's positioned that I could make something happen like that. And I mean charging the other gobber and maybe charging past it so I could have the the reach weapon on it. So uh, I'm just trying to figure out what I need to do here. And priority number one is to kind of get the gator gone and deal with the swamp horror that's, uh, you know, four inches away from Zerkova. That yeah, because I was actually I did have melee range for like the two last attacks, but she was camping one. Yep, and I figured it was better to go for the attrition play. So I think Throne uh, puts Stir the Blood on Legion of Lost Souls, and then decides to charge the Swamp Horror. Yeah, I stay in base with the objective. I figure that these things can help me block, and you see the numbers there. I just blew up the damage roll on the Swamp Horror. He half held it. Yep, Gabriel with Throne did a lot flash. of work. Yep, that Weapon Master Pow fourteen because I think. You dark shrouded, dark shrouded with uh, uh, numb nuts. What's his name? Uh, Ragman. So Gabriel Throne was sitting, swinging at Pow 14s. I probably could have done this to make a little bit, get a little bit more damage out there with the Hermit, but uh, I decided to just unpack this way. Uh, the Thamorite Advocate that's alive goes down to the bottom zone to start contesting. It's not going to last long, but I just want to make sure that I can kind of keep up the pace with the scoring game because if you'll pay attention to our clocks. Uh, Ethan's time is rolling down a little bit further than what mine's going to. Um, he's right now, he, he had top of one. He's 10 minutes behind me. I feel like I might be able to do a lot of work this turn and be able to start banking more time than he has. So as long as I can be annoying enough, I might be able to drain the clock out on him that way to attrition. But, uh, 
I need to still start doing work and get rid of some of these heavies because one heavy can just devastate my whole army if I don't place right. So uh, Alexia goes over and does Power of Death, and I've got two Legion of Lost Souls charging the Gobber that's in the zone. They need an eight to hit. They need sevens with Vet Leader. Sevens with Vet Leader, and not a single one connects. It's really unfortunate. Um, so now we're going into the, uh, the gator and I believe that the hermit did his thing too here. So we've got like a plus eight damage swing on him. Yep. Your pow 12 dudes are now dice plus one on my arm 19 heavy. Like, yep. So we're doing a lot of damage to like four of them just wreck them. Yeah. We get him out of there. No problem. So on the ones that I really, I, I wanted to get the gator gone. Don't get me wrong, but I really wanted to get that gobber gone. And we end up making uh, another dude from the Gatorman's corpse. So that also feels really good, too. So now I decide to unpack the Morrowin as my Hail Mary deal to get him out of there. And she can't hit him either. Goober's just so good. So that was a super unfortunate event. Uh, I had talked about it a little bit in our game. I was like, maybe if I combined melee with the Legion of Lost Souls, it would have been better. But I think the two chances out of seven feels better than one chance out of five. Maybe, maybe it's about the same. And probably is about the same. I would personally go for the two sevens, but yeah, I think for me, I'd rather go with the lower numbers to hit just because that's how I prefer to do it. Uh, because yeah, a 50, 50, right. I mean, like there's a good chance. There's 25% chance. Both of those don't make it. So it's like a 75% chance you hit. Yeah, I guess, but still like, I don't know. I was going to make a, 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 a anecdote about doing something unfortunate, but I can't think of anything right now. Like a series of unfortunate events that this turn turned into? Yeah. like So things start sliding down here. Um, I get my advocate to go next, and I decide to hex bolt the um, swamp horror that is engaging Throne, and uh, she must have... This must be Zerkova. Somebody had some boosted attack rolls here. Something I don't know exactly who was doing the attack. It wasn't the maybe the advocate shot and missed, but somebody had some boosted dice here, and it might have been Zerkova. Just like, oh, it was her gun. This yep. is this is what the deal is. So Zerkova moved up because that advocate's already dead. Um, Zerkova moved up and shot her rod of ruin. I think is what it's called, or rod of whispers, and it's more like the Billy Club of whispers, but whatever. So I end up hitting hitting the swamp horror i kill it because i crank damage like crazy and then uh now we're working between the interaction with the grave grave spirit door that i have which turn let moves him and turns him into an arc node and then ethan's death rage so based on the timing we figured out that death rage happens first yep because it's on disabled and then it rfps right away so i don't get my arc node yep not that i needed it but it would have been nice to be able to just arc some stuff out maybe throw something at, Zer- uh, not Zerkova, but throw something at Jaga Jaga to like make her, you know, fear things a little bit. Mm-hmm. So uh, next next up then I just, I'm figuring out like, what do I want to do? There's There's got to be a way I can deal with this goober that's just hanging out in the top of my zone. Uh, but the other thing about this is now that Zerkova's went here, um, I don't have the ability to get her into the zone to score it. And the Legion of Lost Souls are spread out enough to where they can't score it either. So uh, I just kind of give up on the idea of trying to get rid of the gobber and just put down a cloud to stop the, maybe make it a little bit more difficult for Ethan to put damage on me if uh, the Swamp Horror unpacks into Zerkova. Next up, we roll three shots with that Thamorite Archon again. So they're living the dream and they end up putting enough damage into it to leave it on like four boxes or something. Yeah, it was on six. And that one rolled three shots as well. Thamorite Archons are really good when they just roll threes. Yeah, every shot you've done so far, you rolled threes. Mine never do that. And they just rocked everything they hit today. Yeah, it felt really good uh, to get that objective out of there. So luckily for me, uh, Brian didn't score anything, so I'm still up 3-1. I'm down on clock, but... Or no, you, you took my objective, so it's 3-2. to two. Yep. But things are looking 
okay for me. I think it's three to one, isn't it? I haven't, I never scored any other point other than this one. Oh, because right. I couldn't score the middle zone with anything, and I couldn't score the top zone or the yep. top zone with anything. Yep, because you could have put Zerkova in the middle, but then she probably just dies. Yep. So I think you're trying to figure out what to do with the other gobber. Yeah, he just. Oh, you were like, I'm gonna try and attack this guy. Yeah, a box to cars. add insult to injury. But it, he misses, so it's not a big deal. No. So Spell Slave walks up. I decide just to get into the zone. I'm thinking about Bone Shaker in, but it's like the master plan this turn is to send in Melvin and Mayhem with the button and try and take out the other unit. So I end up deciding not to Bone Shaker because that would actually limit one of my killing spree targets. So, and like there's no way I'm hitting a Thamorite. So I just decide to ghost walk Jaga so that way she can get deeper into the woods and try and run away from Thamorites. Yeah, and then she doesn't have to cast it. Having spell slave and ghost walk is really nice because yep. ghost walk is a really impactful spell and I wish I had it. <laughs> yes, because she's putting up signs importance and then she put elasticity on the horror after upkeeping uh, her... She upkept um, the plus two speed spell, the swamp... Battle host. Battle host. Uh, Fake the, escort. Yep. The... Spell Slave was just out of range of uh, keeping up the free upkeep because of the way he walked, so she had to pay for it, so she's sitting on zero. Yeah, that's pretty dangerous for her. Yep, but I'm hopefully going to be taking out this damn right. Uh, Effort Scout moved up, clear the zone. Uh, so Billy is hitting the button, charging 10. He's got reach, he's got power 20, and he's got killing spree. Yeah, because so like, he's all elasticity and all that. Yep, because reach killing spree is legit. So I decided to charge the Thamorite. I boost the hit because, like, a mat seven, I need a signs importance boost at nine. I hit exactly with a nine. Mm -hmm. And then this is POW 20, dice plus three. I roll one, 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 two. And then with Hermit buff, we realize I leave him on one box on the charge. Yep. So I, I, I always forget, even if I have the token out, I always forget that the Hermit's buff is up. So, uh, the the war room shows seven, but we correct it real soon to get him down to one. Yep. So I take my killing, or I take my fist into a guy next to him, because uh, I'm like I really don't want to have to boost into the archon and risk missing. Uh, so I'm just going for the other dudes at this point. So I'm just killing, spraying through. Need sixes, hit, kill. I'm not doing the warhead trigger because that would actually kill models. Yep, and, then, and you need that killing spree. Yep. Killing spree on a Mat Seven he or Mat Six heavy. Mat, Mat seven. seven. Mat Seven heavy is just really ridiculous. And when you give them reach, it's just bananas. Yeah. So I'm going up, punching the advocate. I need a signs important seven, and I miss. So I have to buy my last attack, and I miss. So I didn't do as much as I hoped, just because of that poor, poor charge. Like, yeah, the, not killing the the Thamorite Archon on the charge was really rough for you. Rolling f a four on five dice was really unfortunate. Yep. Because now I got to deal with that Thamorite. I think this is the um, Effort Scouts shooting into the objective. Uh, that was Scythe oh, shooting Scythe. the objective. because Sorry. It's, uh, it's in the Hermidoria, so dice minus six Weapon Master with signs importance. She just rocks it. Yeah. And then she redirects in the throne who is in the Hermit Aura, and I believe I leave him on three. But I killed the objective, so I get two running gun. Uh, now this Effort Scout moves up, and he's going to try and plunk a shot into uh, Throne. I hit. I am dice damage, uh, because you're a nine down to a seven, and then you remember he has tough. Yep, so I was like, ah, he's dead. But no, we got tough, and then I tough anyways. So now he's still there, which is not the greatest. It's not like the end-all, be-all of awesome. It's just nice to have Ethan to have to chew through more stuff now since you're starting to run out of things to do it with. Yep. Uh, there, I'm measuring if I move too far back with the Wastelander. He can see three inches out of the woods, so he charges. Because uh, I really don't want the Swamp Horror to have to boost. Uh, Matt, eight, signs importance, hits the eight. And then a POW-10 decap weapon master just rocks him. Yeah, it just destroys her. And then I sprint forward him, sorry. to engage uh, Zerkova. Because I'm really worried about Jaga dying. So I figured if I can limit where Zerkova goes, it's all good. Uh, Horror walks up, staying just outside the cloud, punches Ragman, kills him. And then I have exactly enough attacks left to kill the Hermit if I hit every single one. So... 
my second tentacle hits, kill, does one, third hits, and then I buy two, and I buy the last one, I hit, I kill, so I'm, I'm feeling pretty good. And then I overtake, I can't buy any more attacks, but that feels fine. And, and I think then, here's where I stop you and say, I'm going to make a thrall because like I, I, not that I missed the trigger, but I just kind of forgot that it was living things specifically. So I was like, I'm going to make a thrall real quick. And it goes back where uh, the hermit was. So this might feel a little shady, but I just had missed the trigger for it. I mean, I'm not worried about it. Like, I didn't have any more attacks anyway, so it didn't really matter. Yeah, but it just means that I'm contesting now where I wasn't before. I mean, it's an ability she has. Like, Yeah. I just literally moved past it before you could do the trigger. So, I've at, we've at least contested the zone. S Ethan's scoring the bottom one, but I don't feel like the scenario pressure is at a point where I really need to worry. Looking at the clock, I still have 20 minutes almost compared to Ethan's three mi less sub three minutes. So I feel like maybe I can go for this attritional play to do things. So my goal is to try and just like get Zerkova out of danger and get her into a scoring position because I feel like that gobber is going to go down this turn. Well, I hope it does at least. I mean, I am up four to one. So yeah. Maybe I can play the long game, but... Maybe, but I think with... Uh, yeah, you might be able to, like, start doing some work. I, I still have enough to, like... I guess I, I don't have quite enough to deal with a lot of the things that are in my zone right now, so I decide to kick this thing off by seeing if a Thamorite Archon can get some damage on Jaga. And this is where I decide to roll only one shot, and I miss, and uh, that kind of takes that off the table. I feel like if I got a couple shots here and maybe were, was able to connect with, uh, with Jaga Jaga, then maybe I can you know, maybe get uh, Zerkova to do some damage to her with some spells from downtown. Uh, I think in hindsight, instead of going after Jaga Jaga with the one attack, I probably should have seen, I roll one, I'm going to shoot the the gator because then maybe I can turn it into an arc node with my gun and then get into Jaga Jaga and start throwing sprays at her. So I think now what we've done is my mistake for the game was uh, misinterpreting how much damage a decap could do it's not misinterpreting like i know how much damage it can do but i decided to just play fast and loose and say i'm going to take the free strike from him so ethan connects and i thought i was okay because i always see the white die as the location and even when it's not thrown as thrown as part of a, a attack on a war beast or something so i thought i was fine i thought i was on one box but uh, i'm actually overkilled by like 12 i did i rolled a a 14 <clears throat> after dice minus five yep so we decide to just walk this back a little bit and uh start spraying we sprayed uh the waste wastelander twice to get it cleared off and then did a bunch of other sprays and you'll notice that i'm running ethan's clock down now so that big clock advantage that i have is basically trash now because um i've uh i've let ethan's clock wear down so i've kind of it, my personal thing is I've just wiped clock from being a successful way to play this game anymore. So uh, already I've messed up three times now, like twice maybe, twice, at least twice. So I, we end up playing the turnout, and no matter where I go, Zerkova is just dead. Like Malvin and Mayhem are standing right by her, and it's not going to take them much to get there. And uh, the Swamp Horror also can go where it wants to and get some work done. So, like, things just aren't going good for me. I think we decide to pull the plug here, and that's going to go to Ethan for probably assassination or scenario, one or the other. Whatever you want. Dealer's choice. I mean, like, there is the chance I clock. I had a little over two minutes left, but you didn't contest my zone, so I automatically go to five. Yep. You there are so many ways you can win here. You killed the Goober, so you went five to two. Mm -hmm. But, like... I have speed nine solos. Yeah, they can run wherever they want and can and, test everything. Yeah, all Melvin has to do is punch two dudes in the zone and killing spree over into yours. Yep. So, like, it's all about how fast I can do it. Mm -hmm. And, like, as you can see, I'm not a very fast die roller when it comes to all these overtake attacks. It yeah. Just, it just eats the clock. I think, uh, overall... I had discussed earlier about my, like, my pairing theory with this one. We talk about it a little bit, and... 
Old Witch 2 would have probably been the better call to go into Jaga Jaga. Um, even maybe into Azazlo. Like, it just feels like a better matchup. But then the more we talked about it afterwards, the more I thought, like, maybe as much as I love Old Witch 2 as a Doom Reaver caster, if I try to go from this perspective, this two lists that are very similar pairing style, uh, I really should be playing with Vlad 2 because both Zerkova and Old Witch 2 bring a lot of anti-shooting stuff. So when I have those two lists, they really don't pose different questions to my opponent. They're really samey. So with Vlad 2, however, I end up being able to hit high defense like nothing because of transference, or whatever they call it, Arcane, Arcane Might now. Power. Arcane Might. And uh, I also can threat forever with my feet. And then with uh, Hand of Fate going on something, whether you're putting that on something like a Conquest or a Victor or a small unit of Greylord Outriders... I can scalpel pieces out with those. So it just felt like if I want to revisit this pairing as like an actual concept for a tournament that will come up eventually sometime, uh, I think the pairing would end up being Zerkova 1 and Vlad 2 because he has defense against some shooting with uh, Windwall, but it's not like going to guarantee all these Doom Reavers safe or safety. So I think that's a good time for Zerkova to be in the pairing. So this game was good to get out of the way for me for preparing for the future if I decide to drop this as a tournament pair. But I really wanted to play something that I was familiar with. So of course I decided to grab a caster I've never played before. Yeah, I mean, she's Kador <laughs> and you're playing Kador Light. She's like so non-Kador Kador that it, she's just really, she's a phenomenal caster. Like I, we were also talking about this afterwards where I think that People look at the damage output for flames with people like Striker 1, Striker 2, or Fiona's ridiculous, not just damage, but threat potential. And I think uh, Zerkova gets overlooked a lot because she is a Kador caster, so people don't really pay attention to her that much because the faction is really middle of the road and not turned over the top. Um, but I think that she's a phenomenal flames caster that brings very new concepts to the list of being able to protect a lot of things outside of like Fiona. And, uh, she just does a lot of work. Like everything that she doesn't have in her kit, the solos bring. Yeah. Like even without her interference, you have an eight strength swing from just all the solos. Cause <clears throat> that's flames. You have army wide, uh, threat extension and your feet helps you deliver the alpha. Like I think it gets weird for Zirkova. Like, she has to play in front of her army for the feet turn. Yeah, just she's got to get real, real, real brave. But, like, she's so safe on feet turn. Like, you can pretty much measure out the threats. Mm -hmm. Like, if you didn't leave any dudes in overtake range, like... Yeah, I just sit... If I, if I keep everything out of, out of your threat completely, yeah, I'm probably, like, waiting later in the turn to unpack. But, like, we're just going to play this weird standoff game. Yeah, and I, I threaten slightly farther. Yeah. It's more of, like, if you send one dude in... And then it's like he's contesting, and now I'm like, I have to kill. I have to proc vengeance. Yep. You didn't really give me any situations where it's like, I need to proc vengeance to clear a zone. No, as, as many times as I've played against Will Work for Food, I always have a problem respecting the, the overtake shenanigans, especially with Jaga Jaga since she does it so uh, consistently. And I, I know, like, we've talked about it before, but Malvin and Mayhem should not have come out the way he did. <laughs> like, he just shouldn't have. He's just, he's too efficient for what he does. And you can sit there and complain as much as you want to about how he's really, like, a 17 or 18 point heavy because you have to bring the gobbers with him. But really, like, that just doesn't matter. That guy is a powerhouse. Yep. Like, when you can abuse him with friendly faction buffs, like, he just, he's already, like, a solid nine. Like, friendly faction buffs just turn him up to 11. Yeah, he's... Shit, they turn him up to 12. He's really gross, in my opinion. Now, I know that my, my perspective might be tilted or tinted a little bit by this experience, but I don't think there's been a time that I... There was one time we played against Malvin and Mayhem where he didn't bother me, and it's because I took him out on the top of, or bottom of one, and then we lost all that data. Yeah. So that was the one time Malvin and Mayhem did not bug me. So, for the record, then... <laughs> He's always done well on the channel because we lost the one game where I played stupid and lost him for nothing. Yep, he's he's two for two so far. Yep. So Malvin and Mayhem for president. Like minions and mercs, like they just do so much for him. Like here, like I fl I flubbed a damage roll. That was it. But otherwise, like he would have just mowed through that. Yep. And like you got to respect the reach killing sprees. Like mm -hmm. it just murders 
everything. That's like I windmill slammed this list. Like I wanted to drop Lord <laughs> as because I'm not gonna butcher that name again. Uh, but like if you drop Doom Reavers, like they just mow through me. Whereas like you're running five units in that other list, yeah. and like if you get gummed up at all, like once you send it, like if I send in my heavies and you send in all the Doom Reavers, like there is solid chance Melvin will kill your whole army. It literally boils down to tough checks and how many bot attacks he has to make. Well, and I think with the Doom Reavers too, like if you pay attention to the table, that might have been a good time for you to actually not take first turn and give me the side that you're on because Doom Reavers deploying with that burning earth at the AD, like just outside the AD line in that house means that they've got to thread a lot of weird needles and they don't really excel at that. I mean, with Apparition and AD, I think they could run around it turn one, and that would be more scary, in my opinion. I guess, maybe. Because then they're up in the zones, and, like, I don't want that. I want to be in the zones before you. But this is such a spread scenario. Like, if you had th two to three units of Doom Reavers on each flank, like, Jaga can only go so far with her 14-inch control range. Yep. So, like, you saw me threading the needle there really tight just to get a Swamp Whore on the fringe of his zone, or your zone, that you took over just to try and keep the Signs of Portance bubble working. So, like, it gets risky with this split scenario. If it's a more centralized, then it's, like, then I'm, Yeah, like, easy peasy. Easy peasy, give me your Doom Reavers. Squeezy. <laughs>